Again, Mark 4 at verse 35. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> and the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him, uh, with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because uh, that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when Jesus, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment, torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was uh, nigh, there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed of the, uh, with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath uh, had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you again for this time to come together before your word. Uh, and we ask that by your spirit, your word will be preached this morning to the glory of your holy name, to the edification of the saints. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before jumping in, there's not really, I don't like to interrupt the liturgy with any kind of like anecdotes. I think the liturgy is important. It has a structure for a reason, so I can put my anecdote here. Uh, Lance mentioned going out to um, talk with uh, people at the farmer's market. It's been going really well. Uh, particularly, Lance had the last two weeks gotten to talk to the same older woman. Uh, Lance did a phenomenal job, uh, not just in content. Content's obviously really important, uh, capitalizing on Jesus being Jehovah, trying to share with them a message that actually brings salvation because they have a false gospel. Uh, so content's important, but uh, also extremely important is disposition. Uh, she was an older woman, extremely condescending, extremely condescending, constantly making little chuckles at Lance, laughing at him, basically like, you know, you're cute, uh, making a good effort kind of thing. Uh, but she eventually sent him away, unable to give a response, sent him away. Uh, you know, Lance communicating his love for her, doing so humbly, doing so well. Uh, and she ended by saying, you know, oh, I'm not mad at you. Uh, if I was mad at you, you'd know because I'd claw your face off. The old woman, you know, never would, have, never would have expected something like that to come out of her mouth, such a vile thing to say to someone. Uh, but that is the fruit of somebody who, you know, loves their religion more than they love the true God. 
uh, because they don't know the true God. So they stand as an enemy of his. Um, and so if you think of it, pray for that woman. Her name is Dale. Uh, and Dale uh, needs to be saved. And uh, she got to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So praise God for that. But she is, a, she is an angry, angry woman. But uh, good ministry out there. Uh, good opportunities. Uh, yeah, Lance was crushing it. So it was, it was a privilege to see. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're hopping back into Mark. I think hard to follow up. Probably preached the best sermon of my life last week. Um, so I'll do my best to follow that up. But, you know, just be gracious. Um, anyway, we talk often of Christ and the reality that he's bringing conquest in the world. As we've talked about that before, bringing conquest over the nations. He's king of kings. He's lord of lords. This is the work that he's doing even now, uh, currently ruling and reigning this earth from uh, the, at the right hand of the Father. Which that, you know, speaking of Jehovah's Witnesses, that is not a trump card. That's something they're going to throw at you. Well, Stephen saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. How can that be if God is one? We don't believe God is one in person. We believe God is one in being, three in person. Jesus being at the right hand of the Father, not a problem. Totally biblical. And not contradicting the Trinity. But one of the remarkable things, so we have that broad concept. We see that all the time in the Bible of Jesus bringing conquest. But one of the remarkable things we get to see in the Bible, and particularly in our text today, is Jesus actually bringing that conquest. We get to see the first fruits of that conquest uh, being manifest as Jesus goes for the first time to a Gentile city, namely Gadara. He goes to the land of the Gadarenes, or at least the countryside near Gadara, uh, by the seaside. And so this is one of the first works of deliverance that we're going to see from Jesus. Uh, We've seen him working in Israel, but this is the first time we're going to see it uh, outside of Israel. His first venture into subduing the nations, really. And it was after a day, just remembering the context, it was after a day of uh, teaching the crowd in parables and then teaching the disciples about the nature of the kingdom of God. And Jesus desires, what we're going to see is a single day trip. He's going to travel all the way across the Sea of Galilee, single day trip. He's going to heal one man and he's going to be out of there. So a trip across the sea to save one man in this Gentile land of Gadara. Now we have two accounts in our text this morning. It's a longer text, uh, and oftentimes these two texts are treated separately. Obviously there's plenty to say about both, so it makes sense to do that. But one of the reasons I want to tackle both in one Sunday is because I think these texts are actually held together in the narrative. I think we'll see that this morning, so it's important to not let that chapter divide be a distraction. Uh, I think this is one, uh, one narrative, and really what's happening in the crossing of the sea is going influ- to impacts what we have happening with uh, the healing of this man possessed by the legion of demons and the drowning of the pigs. One of the major and basic elements of this story, first and foremost, is the sea. Right at the end of chapter 4, we have the sea. And so we need to consider uh, what is a rich symbolism in the Bible in regards to uh, what the sea is. This is the way that Jesus is going to access this Gentile city, and that's important. So what is the sea in the Bible? What does it remind you of? What is it used to symbolize? Thinking back, many of you were with us when we were in San Diego going through the book of Revelation, and so we talked about the sea pretty extensively there. We've touched on it a couple times on Sundays here. But you'll remember that the sea is used throughout the Bible uh, to symbolize the raging Gentile nations. The sea is used to symbolize the raging Gentile nations that stand opposed to the purposes of God and his people. One of the great beasts in Revelation, which we see uh, representative of uh, Rome as an empire, uh, arises from the sea. It's the beast from the sea. We see the same imagery in Daniel 4. Right, You have those four great beasts in Daniel 4, and it's, it's drawing out the same parallel as Daniel 2. So the same nations are represented, Babylon and Persia, Greece and Rome are represented by that great statue in Daniel 2. Well, the same, the same uh, nations are being represented in Daniel 4, but each by a different beast. And those beasts, it's a, there's a whole thing to go into there, but each of those beasts is kind of representative of something about that nation. Uh, each of those nations, the same nations though, Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome, and all of them come out from the sea in Daniel 4. You see that in Daniel 4 verse 3. Isaiah speaks of the enemy nations in the same language. This is from Isaiah 17, verses 12 and 13. He says, Woe to the multitude of many people, which make a noise like the noise of the seas, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. That's Isaiah 17, verse 12. And David in the Psalms, we just started singing this last week, to the tune of the glory of pottery, which is pretty cool. But troublous seas my soul surrounds. Uh, in the Psalms, David says, uh, deliver me. <laughs> You're there. It took you a little bit, but yeah. Uh, in verses 14 and 15 of that Psalm that we just started singing, uh, in Psalm 69, David says, deliver me out of the mire 
and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up. And let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. So we should keep in mind this picture of the seas, uh, what we get in the seas as we come to this Sea of Galilee, as he goes to this Gentile nation. And not only Gentile nations, right, that's not the only thing being pictured, but hostile nations. Right, the sea is not just Gentile nations, but it's nations hostile uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the kingdom of God. And not only hostile nations, but as we see in Psalm 69, it's compared to the, even to the abyss. And so that's what we have represented in the sea as the disciples set out to uh, the land of the Gadarenes. Right, the Bible's not painting a picture of neutral nations. You can't name a single neutral nation in the world just hoping to hear the good news. That's not what, we, that's not what he's going to find in Gadara anyway. But that's not what the people, we're going to see that the people wind up praying for him to leave, begging for him to leave. Right, so they weren't a nation eager to receive the gospel, uh, but they're a nation hostile to it. Right, a people, as Psalm 2 says, right, imagining vain things, plotting against the Lord and his anointed, as we sang this morning from Psalm 2. So again, after this day full of teaching, Jesus sets out on the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. See this in verse 35, desiring to pass to the other side. And we see that there's other boats traveling in verse 36. Uh, we're not given a reason for why we, these other boats are even mentioned here. We don't hear anything else about them. Uh, I think one decent hypothesis would be that um, there's witnesses to the storm that's about to happen. So there's other, there's other ships out on, out on the sea. We're not told anything else about them. We don't see them coming to the land that Jesus goes to uh, either. But Jesus sets out for a Gentile city, and he does so by way of the sea. And shortly this sea will be raging like the Gentile nations. The storm that's described for us in verse 37 is not just rocking the boat, right? The boat we read is filling with water from this storm, right? Waves are crashing in, rain is coming down. The waves are beating the ship bad enough that a group, which includes at least four experienced fishermen, are thinking that the result of this storm is that they're going to die, right? So it's that intense. They're not overreacting. Uh, it's, a serious, it's a serious storm, and the Sea of Galilee was known for these types of storms. But aboard this ship, not startled in the least, right, fast asleep, even on a pillow. Some commentaries will tell you it's the type of pillow you would find on a, on a boat. So do with that what you will. Uh, but it, there's a pillow. Jesus is sleeping on it. He's not disturbed in the least as this storm is raging. Right? This is the greater Jonah asleep on the boat. Right? The parallel is clear. If we remember, we'll look quickly at uh, Jonah's actions. Right? He, Jonah, obviously, there's, a, there's a, an exercise in contrast between Jesus and Jonah. Jesus didn't sin to cause this storm to come about. Jonah, because of his sin, right, he's fleeing from Nineveh, not going to preach to the people that God told him to preach to. So he's on this, this boat. And, uh, and we read in, in Jonah chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. So again, serious storm. Uh, the people realize that they're in danger. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man to, unto his God. Right, to no avail. These are uh, dumb, deaf, blind gods. And cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea uh, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Right? Jesus is asleep during the storm. Jonah asleep during the storm. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Jesus, like Jonah, was asleep amidst a great storm that terrified every single other passenger in the ship. Everyone else is terrified. Jonah's shipmates would see the storm quelled by throwing Jonah into the waters of judgment, right? That's how the storm ceased for them and how their lives were spared, right? Thrown into this sea, which represents uh, the raging Gentile nations, also represents the abyss, right? Thrown into the abyss, given up unto judgment. Jesus' shipmates would find peace as Jesus himself rebukes the wind and the waves with just a word. Now, Jesus here shows, of course, his lordship over nature, and also showed that he would be the one to quench the judgment of God for his people. Right? As Jonah was able to do so, Jesus would be able to do. Jonah was judged for his own sins. Christ would be judged for the sins of his people. But beyond the parallels to Jonah, we see that Jesus, even to the eyes of these still barely seen disciples, right? Jesus is going to say that they have, why do you have no faith? Which is not an absolute no faith, but a, a severe lack of faith. Right? Because remember, they're calling upon Jesus to help them. So there's, there's, a, there's a kernel of faith in that. Uh, but it's a faithless statement. Uh, that we'll get to shortly, care us not that we perish. Uh, but even to these eye, the eyes of these barely seeing disciples, uh, Jesus has an ability beyond a mere man. Right? To command the wind and the waves is a big deal. A really big deal. 
right? The wind and the sea are obedient to his word. And this is something explicitly, like these, these Jews knew their Bible. This is something explicitly that only Jehovah could do. Right? Psalm 107 at verse 23. They that go down to the ships in uh, the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of who? Of the Lord. The works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commanded, Jehovah commanded, and raised the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven, they go down into the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and at, or at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. Right? Who did the disciples turn to? Well, Jesus, their master, is in the ship. They turn to him. And he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. And they are glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Right? To watch someone calm the seas with a word is to see the work of Jehovah. Right, and this work leads to an even greater fear in the disciples. We see they're, they're, and it's not like they didn't have a mounting fear. Right? They've got a fear of death as this storm is growing and as the ship is filling with water. And then it says that they feared even more when Jesus rebukes the wind and it ceases. Right, we see that in verse 41. They feared the storm, which showed their lack of faith and then led to a rebuke from Jesus that we see in verse 40. Now, before thinking more about Jesus' rebuke to the waters themselves, right? we have two rebukes in our text. Jesus rebukes first the water, and it's calm, and then he rebukes the disciples for their lack of faith, right? for an ungodly fear and for a lack of faith. So let's more, look more at uh, Jesus' rebuke to the disciples first. Again, he says to them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Right? Jesus says this to the disciples after uh, really an accusatory statement from the disciples. Carest thou not that we perish? Now, to think that God does not care about your circumstances, to have that thought, is a faithless thought. An absolutely faithless thought, such that Jesus, to a people who had a level of faith, he says, you have, that's, a, that's a faithless thought, why you have no faith. To think that God does not care about your circumstances. To say that God does not care about your circumstances, your difficulties, is a faithless statement. You should not think that way, you should not speak that way. Or maybe you're facing persecution from family or coworkers for sharing the gospel. Right? Has God not brought about those circumstances? Maybe you're in a difficult season of your marriage. Maybe fights have increased. Disagreements have seemed to multiply or intensify. And this has caused you to feel trapped or to despair. Maybe you've been bombarded lately by financial hardships. Maybe you're in a season of feeling completely dominated by your sin. Right? Failing in waging that war against your flesh. Whatever your circumstances, whatever your challenges, your difficulties, you cannot for a second think that God does not care. That's a faithless thought. And it's not, it has nothing to do with him not sending the storm because he did send the storm. Right? That's not the comfort. The comfort's not that God is in your corner and he really can't do anything about the evils in this world that come upon you. And, but he's in your corner. He's rooting for you. He wants the best for you. No, God sends the storms. The comfort is not that the situation is completely outside of his control. Right? The comfort is that the one who sends the storms also sent his son to be the propitiation for your sins. That's our comfort. Even when we can't see clearly, even when things are cloudy, circumstances are dismal, God sent his son for us. He loves us. How will he not with him give us all things? Maybe, just maybe, these storms of your life are serving a far greater end than you can currently imagine, than you can currently see. Maybe you need to have faith to pluck your head out of the current pain, the current difficulties of your life, the hardships of your circumstances, and see that God has a plan that stretches far beyond what you can see now. And it's a plan, you must believe, chalked full of glory. God cares about you perishing. He cares about you feeling stuck in a rut. But don't equate God caring for you with a life full of ease. Those aren't one and the same. But it's not off the table that your difficult circumstances are because of your sin. That's not off the table. You have to consider that first and foremost. And therefore, the difficulty may only be alleviated by repentance. But either way, our duty, your duty, is to trust God. Trust God. Right? Do you feel like you're being disciplined? Well, that's good news. God disciplines those he loves. That's a good thing, a good place to be. 
and he's not a cruel father. Right? God is love. And Paul says love is patient and kind. Right? God, that means, is patient with us. And praise God for that. He's patient with us. He's not expecting everything to be cleaned up in our hearts and in order in an instant. He knows, and he's, he knows us, and he's gracious with us. Knows us better than we even know ourselves. And we should not act as if we are owed this grace, but we should recognize in gratitude that God is patient and gracious with us. Right? Just as his grace is not a, li- a license for sin, his patience is not a license to take your time in reforming from things that you know are uh, awry in your life. Right? Things that are not in line with God's word. Right? His patience is meant to lead us to repentance. His discipline ultimately, right? What do you believe about God's discipline? Do you believe that God's discipline is sent to in order to crush you? Well, that's a, a bad view of God's discipline of you. Ultimately, it's not going to crush you. It's going to build you up. That's what God's going to do through his discipline. His discipline is going to form you into the image of Christ, and we ought to desire nothing more than that end for ourselves. And so we cannot prefer our own comforts and our own desires above that which would form us into the image of Christ. It's our duty to repent when we, uh, when we find ourselves thinking that God does not care if we perish. Do not allow yourself to think that. And don't, uh, don't go the other route of trying to take a, put a holy veneer on that and think that it's your uh, understanding of just how sinful you are. Uh, that you just think, oh, well, uh, you know, God doesn't care. God doesn't care about me. I'm such a horrible sinner. No, it's, you're, you're undermining the grace of God, the love of the Father for you, uh, when you wanting to try to take that road. Oh, you're, you're, too, you're too sinful uh, to have God's patience. No, it's not, about, it's not about your level of sinfulness. We are all horrible sinners. It's about the fact that God is gracious with us. He's patient with us. Right, the disciples are faithless here in one sense, but again, as I mentioned, note that they turn to Christ. They turn to their master for deliverance, and so they receive deliverance. Right, they have received deliverance because they turn to Christ with... <laughs> A minuscule amount of faith enough for him to say, why do you have no faith? And here he is delivering them. God is abundantly gracious with us. Their lack of faith, their hardness of heart was not a complete absence of faith. And so Jesus delivers them from this storm. But as I mentioned already, this rebuke of the disciples was the second rebuke that Jesus gave. The first was to the wind and the sea in verse 39. And I believe this is uh, part of what ties our two narratives together, uh, is seeing uh, this rebuke uh, to, to the wind and the waves. So this language is very similar to the command, if you think all the way back to Mark chapter 1, to a command that Jesus gave when uh, he first comes into the synagogue, and it's the first demon-possessed man that Jesus faces. He faces a man in the synagogue, and, he, and Jesus rebuked him in verse 25, saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. Right? Same language used, hold thy peace, as he says, peace be still to the waves. In our text, the disciples see the fruit of the rebuke, and what do they say? They ask who Jesus is, who is this man, that even the wind and the waves obey him. Right? In Mark 1, Jesus exercised a demon, and all the people in the synagogue marveled and said, Who is this man who has power over the demons? Right? The demons, he speaks to the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Right? Very similar language. We're going to see the same language come up at the start of chapter 5 in this second narrative. As in Mark 1, the demons will directly address Jesus. Right? Who are you, Jesus? Are you coming to torment us before the time? Jesus will tell the demon to come out of the man, and uh, that man will go forth free and proclaiming Christ. Now, he does so in disobedience, right? Jesus told him to shut his mouth, to not, to not go forth telling people, but he goes forth telling people anyway. We're going to see the same thing in our text, except our, our guy uh, who is possessed with the legion is going forth in obedience. Right? He wants to stay with Jesus, and then he goes forth in obedience uh, to proclaim the gospel throughout the Decapolis. So this new scene begins on the shore of Gadar in verse 1. Again, a Gentile city and the first in Jesus' ministry. On the shore of this Gentile town, Jesus is met by a man we read with an unclean spirit in verse 2. Now, he's a man living in the tombs near the shore and is beyond the help of anyone in Gadar. And not for lack of effort, right? We read of all these people coming, trying to help him, trying to bind him with chains. Uh, They're unable to to keep him in these chains. He's breaking free of them, breaking free of the clothes that they give him as well. Chains are no good in holding him. This man was in complete bondage to the demons. And because of that bondage to the demons, was unable to be bound by anyone else. That's what we see in verse 3. Again, not for lack of effort. Is what, we see, is what we see in verse 4. But he's always managing to break free. And so we should note here, uh, before moving on too quickly, uh, that these demons are very powerful. These demons are very powerful, much more powerful than a mere man, even a man on PCP. Breaking free of changes, that's next level. 
Right, not a small, not a small thing to be breaking free of these chains. And yet we see this man doing so repeatedly, unable to be bound. So these demons are no joke, and they possess a power beyond human strength. Right, his life we read is marked by cries from these gathering tombs and cutting himself with stones. In verse five. Right, this man who could not be bound saw Jesus, we read in verse 6, and he runs to him and he bows down to him. Our text even says he worships him. I don't think this is a true worship because we have demons here who hate Jesus. Right, they hate God. They're not offering him true worship, but they do want something from him, and they do recognize his power. Right, these demons, which can't be bound, right, breaking free of chains like it's nothing, come bowing before Jesus because they know of his power. They know who he is. That, look at how they address him, right? Son of the Most High God. Clearer view than anyone else has at this point. And so the demon, we read in verse 7, shrieks before Jesus, asking him not to torment him, calling Jesus again the Son of the Most High, and demonstrating the depth of knowledge that these demons have as to who Jesus is. And it's, again, a reminder that knowledge of who Jesus is is not enough. You must have love for him. You must be submitted to him. Right? This false worship at his feet, which is really just them begging, we'll see, to not be sent out of this country, which is interesting. They just seem to be really at home in Gadara. It's a good place for them. We'll consider that shortly. But that's, that's what they come to him uh, doing. Uh, and they're doing this because Jesus has already, we read in verse 8, told the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Jesus then asked the demon uh, to name himself in verse 9, which is when we discover that there are many demons inhabiting this one man. He uses the term legion, and we read, if we put that together with how many pigs we're going to see drowning in the sea, which is 2,000. Kind of a hard thing to comprehend. I was trying to picture that. I was like, you can kind of picture like 50 pigs drowning in, in a sea. That's, that's like, you can get your mind around that. And then like 100, you're like, I'm not going to be able to count that high. I'm going to like, you know, mess up counting that many. That's a lot. Well, 100 times 10, that'd be 1,000 pigs. There's 2,000 pigs drowning in the sea. Kind of hard to, hard to picture. And important to just recognize that's like an overwhelming scene. This is an overwhelming sight to see. But from that, we know 2,000. We'll talk more about that shortly. But 2,000 pigs. So we have 2,000 demons inhabiting this man. They use the term legion. Uh, legion referred to a, a subset of a Roman, the Roman army, and those were usually about 6,000 men. Right, this legion of demons continues to try to work out a deal with Jesus in verse 10, asking that they be sent uh, not out of the country of the Gadarenes entirely. And one of the reasons this is particularly interesting is because at the end of our text, we're going to see that the people in Gadara are begging Jesus to leave. Demons are saying, this is a really good place for us. We'd like it if you let us stay here. And it makes a lot of sense when you get to the end and you see that these people want nothing to do with Jesus. Right, but Jesus hears this request from the demons and he uses it as what I think is a teaching moment for the disciples. Right, on a nearby mountain, there's a great herd of swine eating in verse 11. And we know from the Old Testament, pigs are considered unclean. We see that in Leviticus uh, 11, verse 7, and Deuteronomy 14, 8 as a couple examples. And it was these pigs that the demons wanted to enter into in verse 12. Jesus grants their request in verse 13. And the immediate fruit is that this herd of pigs... You know, trample, trampling over one another, sprinting down, thousands of them, running into the Sea of Galilee, drowning. It's like the most anti peta text in the Bible. In a, in a Bible full of them. Right, but they wouldn't do well with this text this morning, but even a less extreme view of how we should treat animals, right, even just a more reasonable approach, would still be a little bit bothered, most likely, by 2,000 pigs sprinting down a mountainside, down the shore, and into the water. Right, that was people's livelihoods. You think about it. Right, those were owned by somebody. Someone was taking the time to feed them. So that, there's people who invested money in these pigs. They expected to feed their families with them. They expected to sell them so they could have money to buy other things to feed their families with them. And I'm sure more than just a few people were affected because you got 2,000 pigs over here. And here's this man from Galilee who has allowed these demons. The demons are the ones who do it. Jesus doesn't force them to do it. But he allows the demons to go into that. And surely he knows what the demons are going to do. And he allows these demons to enter into these pigs and to drown them in the sea. He allows the carnage anyway. Not one or two. Not 50, not 100. 2,000 pigs. A legion of pig carcasses drowning in the water. Now Jesus here was painting a picture. What's he doing? What's happening here? I think Jesus is painting a picture of what's truly going on. Jesus was coming to the Gentiles to wage war. He's coming to the Gentiles and his, his efforts here are waging war. 
Right? It might have looked like this small fishing boat with a cute little pillow in the back for Jesus to sleep on. But make no mistake, this is a battleship coming across the Sea of Galilee to Gadara. It's a battleship. Right? Nearly capsized by the previous storm, the previous night's storm. Pay no mind, this is a battleship. Right? This is the Son of God going forth to war, a kingly crown to gain. Jesus is going to subdue the nations unto himself. And in typical mustard seed fashion, right, going forth in this battleship to conquer the Gentile nations to save one man, to deliver one man from a legion of demons. One man would be delivered from the bondage of Satan, and Jesus would be gone as quick as he came. But the seed would be planted in Gentile land, right, the flag planted in the shore, in the, in the sand. Right, a definitive victory over this one man's bondage to sin and Satan that would sh- be sure to multiply. Right, spiritual war was being waged, of which Jesus was the victor. I think that's the picture that we have here. This is a spiritual war being waged. The fruit from his work in Gadara is not only death. It's not like the only fruit is the death of these 2,000 pigs. Right, the fruit is the destruction of many unclean and the making of one clean. That's the picture Jesus is painting. Thousands of demons conquered for the salvation of one man. Right? Jesus' battle against the principalities and powers of this world would result in men being delivered from bondage and receiving life. Right? And so the demons came from indwelling a man, a man made in the image of God. And he's been delivered. Right? Worthy, more worthy and more to be celebrated than the death of 2,000 pigs. The enemies of God represented in the pigs have been drowned in the same sea Right? Note that. There's no other sea around. This is the Sea of Galilee. And the same sea through which Jesus brought his disciples safely through. Right? The waters of deliverance for the people of God were the waters of judgment for the enemies of God. Right? Mark gives us here a mini exodus. He brings the disciples safely through these tumultuous waters, and he drowns the demon pigs in the same waters. Right? And if you, were to, if you were to ask a Jew in this time who their main enemy was, who would they say? They're going to say the Romans. The Romans are their main enemy, right? And so that's who must be conquered. If, if God is going to send a Messiah, and that Messiah is going to establish a kingdom, who would need to be overcome? It would be the Romans, right? Jesus is painting a different picture through this graphic example. The main enemy to the kingdom of God being established was Satan and his legion of demons. That's the main enemy to the kingdom of God. Jesus was not concerned with bringing freedom from Rome in the same way he is concerned with bringing freedom from those in bondage to sin, death, and the devil. And so Jesus came to conquer the Gentile nations, right? Coming to conquer. And the first thing he does is set a man free. Praise God for a, a Messiah like that, a conquering king who comes and doesn't just wipe out his enemies, but actually offers salvation to them. Right, he's waging war against the evil one, Gadara being the first Gentile land where Christ again plants his flag. Now we need not pit Christ's work of conquest against his work of salvation. One of the ways he is bringing conquest is through the work of salvation. It's not the only way. God will be a just judge of all who stand opposed to him. But God is bringing conquest through the work of salvation. Right? And this is of course the case for us and cause for eons of rejoicing. Certainly a lifetime here of rejoicing, and, and yes, rejoicing forevermore. Right? We who were once enemies of God have been brought into the commonwealth of Israel, Paul says in Ephesians 2, through the blood of Christ. Moving on to verse 14, we see that there's men uh, feeding these pigs, and they run into town, run into Gadara to tell everyone what's happening. Certainly many pig owners running back with them. When those in the town ran out to see the pigs and the and the state of this demon-possessed man, which he's, he's, I'm sure he's known by the whole town as the crazy guy out in the cliffs, where right? your kids aren't allowed to go play over there, right? Many people have gone out to try to help him. The strongest men of the city probably going out to try to help him, all to no avail. They come out, they see these thousands of pigs drowning in the sea, and they see this demon, this, once possessed, this one man once possessed with a legion of demons sitting at the feet of Jesus. We don't have him sitting at the feet of Jesus. We see him clothed in his right mind and seated, but in Luke's parallel account, Uh, We see him seated at the feet of Jesus, right? Likely being taught by Jesus. That's what we see in verse 15. The people of Gadara are marked by a great fear, right? Another fear in our text, just like the initial fear of the disciples. That's not a godly fear, uh, though it is an overwhelming fear, 
right? the disciples first feared for their lives. Now we see uh, the people of Gadara marked by a great fear at what they are witnessing between the sane man and the thousands of pigs choked in the sea. Not a true fear of God that would cause them, it is a fear of God, it's going to cause them, even in fear and trembling, to press into whatever's happening, whatever Jesus has to say, clinging to his word. Now that's not the type of fear we see, it's a fear that uh, causes them to pray or to beg for Jesus to go away. Get out of our land. Right After everything is explained to them in verse 16, we see in 17 that they're begging Jesus to leave them alone to depart from their coasts. And we see the same word used in verse 18 to describe the exact opposite reaction of the demon-possessed man. Right, He is also praying to Jesus that Jesus would allow him to continue with him. Right, Probably for multiple reasons. One, just sheer gratitude that Jesus would do this. This is obviously uh, this is the Messiah. This is the man worth giving my life to following. Uh, but also, I'm sure, a fear of just, you know, what if the demons come back? Right, so he, he recognizes Jesus is my hope. However, however he's working that out in his mind, he wants to be with Jesus more than anything else, and everybody else in Gadara wants him gone more than anything else. Right, and that stark difference is important to note. The people of Gadara are more concerned with their pigs drowning in the sea than they are with Jesus. Which is, a, it's not an insignificant thing. That's, again, it's a significant thing, most likely people's livelihoods. Right, the demons asked Jesus again if they could stay in this country. Right, it suited them well. Some, some say that this was because many apostate Jews had gone to live in Gadara, and therefore the demons were uh, finding a happy home there. But whatever the exact reason, it's clear that the demons are comfortable and at home in Gadara, and the people are uncomfortable with having Jesus in their country. Right, Jesus is seen granting, therefore, the requests of both parties. He, requests the, the request, uh, he grants the request rather, of the demons in allowing them to continue in that country, and he grants the people's request to depart to return to Galilee. Right, the people of Gadara ultimately cannot see beyond their immediate circumstances to see the great truth that's being declared to them. They cannot see the glory and the deliverance of this demon-possessed man. And so instead of rejoicing in that, they're despairing over the loss of these pigs. Right, instead of begging this, joining this man and begging Jesus to stay with them, they plead with him to depart. This is a dangerous man. This is a man causing us great loss. Sometimes God causes great loss. And they see this and they want nothing to do with it. They don't see that what he offers is far, far greater. They don't have interest in that. Right? He's a compassionate savior. That's what, that's what he's going to tell the, the demon-possessed man to go forth preaching. It's to these people that are rejecting him that Jesus actually, we see, sends the first preacher. They tell him to leave. The demon-possessed man wants to go with him. He says, no, you're going to stay here. You can go preach, preach to your family, preach in the Decapolis, my name, my compassion. Right, the very man that everyone in town thinks is beyond all hope is going to be the one preaching to them eternal hope. Right, the demon-possessed man does not have the privilege of continuing with the one who delivered him. That's what we see in verses 19 and 20, but he's not left without a mission. Right, not just left just thinking about that great day. Though I'm sure he dwells on it often and it was a great encouragement to him. His duty was to go back to Gadara. To the same people telling Jesus to get out of their land and to testify to them of the great things that God has done. The great things that God has done. Right Again, his testimony is to focus on the compassion that God has shown him. And this is again a parallel with Jesus' exorcism in Mark 1. As I mentioned before, I get, except this time, right, he's going forth in obedience to Jesus' command to go forth preaching rather than disobedience. Right? Unlike when Jesus was healing in Israel, he wanted this message spread abroad. Everyone was to hear of God's mercy toward this sinner. Right? Clearly, as we've talked about before, clearly a judgment on the people of Israel that Jesus is bringing healing here and there and then telling, telling them not to spread the word. Right? A great judgment is coming on Israel. But Jesus wants this message among the Gentiles to be spread abroad. Our text makes it sound like that preaching is effective because we read that all men in verse 20 did marvel as they heard the great things that the Lord has done, as they heard of the Lord's compassion on this man. And the unbelieving gatherings will paint Jesus moving forward, right? Those who don't turn to him. What are they going to remember about Jesus? What's their interaction with him? Well, that's the guy who came and drowned all of our pigs in the sea. He's harsh and he's cruel. Right? He allowed so many pigs to be drowned in the sea by those demons. What a cruel man. 
Right? And the same charge, we must recognize, gets leveled against God today. It's no different. Right? He has allowed, he's even called for, if you read the Old Testament, the slaughtering of entire peoples. Isn't, don't you believe that God brings natural disasters? He cruelly brings these disasters on an innocent world. He even says to rejoice at the death of the wicked. He killed his own son. Right, but those with ears to hear will receive this preaching from this man who's been healed, delivered from bondage, and what they will hear and see is the truth. They will understand that God is the just judge. And the fact that he's bringing deliverance to sinners means that he is a God of compassion. He is a God willing to forgive sinners, doing so through the very thing so often framed as this horrific act of God, that of killing his own son, who came willingly for the joy set before him, out of love for his people. Right, what's often called an act of divine cruelty and is framed as such by those who do not have eyes to see. For those who do have eyes is chock full of glory. Both of these stories combine to show us a picture of who Jesus is and what he's working to accomplish in the world. Right, he's the son of the most high as the demons proclaimed. He has authority over the wind and waves and authority over the demons. God is the one who brings the storms. The God who delivers his people and the God bringing destruction on all those who stand opposed to him. Poetically, sometimes using the same means by which he delivers his people. Right? The God who brings the storms of your life is a God of compassion. The stormy waters for the people of God are actually the means for deliverance. The stormy waters are the means of deliverance. Those waters may drown our enemies, but not us. Right? We'll be brought safely through them. And so, do not fear. Do not be a people of fear, these ungodly fears, right? allowing them to creep into your heart. Right? Do not begin to believe or persist in believing that God does not care if you perish. Don't cover it up with that veneer of humility that I mentioned. It's not a good example of seeing how great a sinner you are. It's an example of doubting the goodness of God as your father. Do not doubt his goodness. Do not doubt that he cares whether you perish or whether you thrive. Don't doubt him by fearing your circumstances, but fear him. That's the antidote. Fear God. Right? And if you fear him, it will drive away every other ungodly fear. Right? A heart filled with the fear of God leaves no room for idols. It will cause us, in the most difficult circumstances, not to tell Jesus to flee from us, but to press in all the more to fellowship with God. And note that Christ's authority extends we see here, far beyond the walls of his church. Far beyond the walls of his church. He is the Lord of creation, subduing even raging Gentile nations as they think of their most clever ways to usurp his throne. Right? He came for this very purpose. This is why Jesus came, to be a light to the nations and to call all nations to himself. In closing, I'll read from Isaiah 49, verses 6 through 11. And he said, it is, is it, a, uh, it is a light thing that thou shouldest uh, be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to whom man despiseth, to whom the nation abhorreth to a servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel. And he shall choose thee. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee. And in a day of salvation have I helped thee. I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people. To establish the earth, the cause to inherit the desolate heritages. That thou mayest say to the prisoners, as Jesus said to this bound man, Go forth. To them that are in darkness, as he was in the darkness of the tombs, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways, and their pasture shall be in all high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he, that, uh, for he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by springs of water he shall guide them. And I will make all my mountains a highway, and my highways shall be exalted. Or the demon-possessed man is like the evil nations of today. In a very real sense, left to themselves, completely beyond hope. People have tried, they're completely beyond hope. Right, there's no human remedy for the problems that are at hand in the world today. Right, what could turn our nation from the path of destruction that we have so vehemently set ourselves out on? Right, we're a nation running around naked, 
screaming, cutting ourselves, minimally figuratively, as this man was. Right? Ours is a nation taking counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. But we must understand that this nation, our nation and its leaders, are not a threat to Jesus. Beyond all hope, humanly speaking, but not a threat in the least to Jesus. He will conquer them, dashing them to pieces like a potter's vessel. But we know that the call goes out to them now to kiss the Son. And we must pray that Jesus' conquest of them, of those enemies of God, would be making those enemies friends, as he's so compassionately done for us. We must pray that when God drowns the pigs, when he strips livelihoods and brings calamity on a rebellious people like us, that the people see their need for Christ and repent. We must pray that they do not ask Jesus to depart. For opposition, we know, will be counted as nothing. The enemies of Christ will not wage a successful campaign. Salvation is coming to the ends of the earth. We read that the mountains in Isaiah are being plowed down to exalt the highway of our God. Jesus has already conquered Satan at the cross, and so there is a remedy for our nation, just not a man-made remedy. But it's only the gospel. Only the preached word is the remedy, and it's the same means Christ will use to subdue his enemies. Right? This means. Only Jesus and his powerful word. This is the sword that he's predestined to use. It's the sword coming out of his mouth in Revelation, the sword he's equipped us with. And so we go forth into the tumultuous seas of unbelievers, whether in preaching or simply in living our lives in line with the word and in stark contrast to the demands of our day. We do so equipped with the gospel of peace, loved and protected by Christ. Remember that he is in the boat and he's for us. Right? The winds and the waves obey him. The powerful demons, they bow before him. When Jesus says, peace, be still, what chance do the heathen nations stand? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are Lord of all. Not just Lord of your church, not just Lord of individual believers, but Lord of all that you've made, all that you uphold by the word of your power. And we thank you that uh, with this world that has sinned against you so grievously, uh, that you've been gracious to offer us salvation in your Son. I pray that you'd help us to go forth preaching that word, living in light of that word, uh, and rejoice, believing that you will subdue the nations under your feet. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name.